This video is a re-release of an earlier video in which some viewers experienced audio problems. There were a small number of comments that the audio was too low and sometimes only the left channel worked. Strange as this was a brand new microphone. So the audio has been re-recorded using the old microphone and hopefully those viewers that struggled to listen before will now hear us booming out. Do let us know in the comments if all is well. With more and more people working from home now, here at Lynn Electrics, we've been asked many times about converting a shed into a workspace or work cave, as some people call it. The electrical supply to such a workspace, shed or outbuilding will need careful consideration, as will the earthing arrangements. It's not just a case of hammering an earth rod into the ground and installing any old cable. So let's have a look at what we need to consider. We should begin with a look at the house and its incoming supply, since in most cases the supply to the shed will come from the house. This might be the scenario that we have. A domestic property with a garden and off to one side is the shed. For whatever reason, the customer wants electricity in there. Our first task should be to establish what the electrical supply is to be used for. Is it just a need for a light and a double socket for the odd DIY job? Or is it something more ambitious, like using it for a home office? This will determine the load requirements. We'll keep this video simple and just say that we have a supply coming into the house and that we need power over in the shed. There are three earthing systems in common use and these are the systems that we will look at here. The other two systems are not used in domestic supplies and will not be discussed in this video. The first of these, and historically the oldest, is the TT system. The letter T is Latin for terra or earth. So TT means two earths or two earth rods. One at the supply transformer, the source, and the second one at the house or installation. There is no copper connection between these two earth points and electrical connectivity is through the soil, through the earth. The supplier will provide only a light and neutral to the property and an earth at their own supply transformer. It is up to the customer or installer to provide an earth at the house. Then along came TNS systems. The letters this time are Terra and Neutral and Separate. Earth and Neutral are separate conductors throughout the whole system from the supply transformer to the customer's property and then throughout the installation to the points of use. All are separate. Line and neutral are the normal two conductors and the earth is the lead sheathing around the cable. An earth conductor will be soldered onto this lead sheath at the installation. The more modern way is TNCS. Earth and neutral combined and then separated. Earth and neutral are combined as one conductor and that is the TNC part, and then separated at the house, that is the S part. So TNCS is earth and neutral are combined in the outside part of the system and then separated at the house. A single conductor is the line to the property. The earth and neutral are the copper braid that surrounds the central core, that is the combined part. This braid is then taken to a terminal block inside the service head where two conductors are taken from it. One for neutral and one for earth. This is the separated part. It is important that you understand that TNCS is separated at the point of entry to the house and is never recombined. Once separated, the earth and neutral stay separate throughout all the property, including the sheds, garages and outbuildings. Effectively, once a TNCS becomes a three-wire system, it must stay as a three-wire. So let's take some power to the shed. We may have a TT system with an earth rod at the house and another earth rod at the shed. The cables, two core, are shown here as underground and would normally be SWA cable, steel wire armoured, as this is an accepted method. TNS is next. Simply take an SWA cable to the shed. There is no earth rod at the house and none at the shed. We've shown three core SWA here, but it could be two core SWA with the armoured sheathing 
being used as an earth. And more on this in a moment. TNCS follows the same principle as TNS. Once the combined earth and neutral are separated, where they come into the house, they are never recombined. The feed to the shed will be at a three-wire system, the same as TNS. Cable size matters, so let's take a look at that next. Many factors can affect cable size choice. Three important factors are the load that the cable will carry at peak usage times, the distance from the house to the shed in the points of use, and also the installation conditions. Is it underground? Is it in concrete ducts, etc.? The cable must always be suitably sized. We don't want to dig up the garden six months later because the cable is undersized. In our example, the shed or workspace might be 25 metres away from the house consumer unit. If we decided that the maximum demand was 32 amps, then 4mm 3-core SWA might be sufficient. We could actually use 2-core SWA if we use the steel arm ring as an earth, if the arm ring was correctly terminated at each end. Usually, the effective conductivity how much current can flow in the steel strand of the arm ring is at least equivalent to the electrical conductivity the amps that can flow under normal conditions in the copper conductors in the cable and need not be worried about. It will be sized by the manufacturer and more on this soon. Consider extraneous metallic parts next. If the shed or outbuilding has services or structural parts that are metallic and earthy then main bonding will be required of all these extraneous parts. These are metallic parts that are not part of the electrical installation, but what may be called earthy. They may have a path to earth and may become live parts during an earth fault. So we have to do something about it. We have to bond them to a suitable earth. Extraneous parts that might need main bonding might include the following, although this is not an exhaustive list. Water pipes, gas pipes, oil pipes, central heating systems, metallic building parts that might have a path to earth, metal walls, etc. Metal clad buildings or structural steelwork, aluminium greenhouses and so on. And regulation 411.3.1.2 lists some of these parts. Not everything is an extraneous part. A brick or block built building is basically the same as the house and wooden sheds are not usually considered as extraneous parts. Wood has a high electrical resistance. Metal window frames with no path to earth are not extraneous parts. We can look now at main bonding. Here we have the house and we have now wired up the shed. In the house we have a water pipe in metal supplied by an underground metallic service pipe. In the house this must be bonded with 10mm copper conductor. But the shed has no extraneous parts, no water pipe, so nothing needs bonding in the shed. And our 4mm 3-core or 2-core SWA is still OK. But now we find there's a metallic water pipe into the shed. Customer wanted a sink with a tap in the shed and a branch was taken from the pipe in the garden. Now we have a problem. Regulation 544.1 says that this should be bonded with 10 mm conductors in most cases. But we only have 4 mm conductors and this will not comply with regulations. You may ask, why not use the steel arm ring as bonding? Why can't that be used? The answer to that question is the conductivity of the steel. The steel arm ring is only about 12% as efficient at carrying current as copper. This means that the arm ring would need to be eight or nine times greater in surface area than the copper to carry the same load. At normal load currents, this is not a problem, but during a fault, when hundreds of amps might flow, the arm ring is just not up to the job. To be equivalent to 10 mm copper, we would need the arm ring to have an effective surface area of at least 80 mm. So the best solution is to install 10 mm 3-core armoured cable in the first place. If this is done at the time of the initial install, the extra expense on top of the cost of the project is minimal. It makes perfect sense to do this and the job is done correctly and safely and it can lower the ZS and lower the voltage drop. And lastly, some people will ask, 
why not just make it a TT system then? This will save copper since the 4mm cable can stay in place and all we need to do is bang in an earth rod. But it's not so simple. This can actually introduce problems that are difficult to overcome. The first of which would be obtaining a suitably low earth reading of just a few ohms. Consider this. The water service comes to the neighbour's property as is common in the UK. But our customer has had the incoming pipe work changed to plastic and, keeping it simple, now he does not need to bond the pipe work in his house. But should a fault occur in the neighbour's house, where the water pipe becomes energised, this voltage will travel along the metallic water pipe past the shed and up to, but not into, our customer's house. It is stopped by the plastic pipe work. But what about the shed? Unless the earth rod is 5 to 10 metres away from the energised water pipe, there will be a voltage induced into the earth rod and all the earths and bonding in the shed will be energised at that voltage, which could be considerable. Can you be certain that the earth rod is at least 10 metres from any underground cables or pipework? This induced voltage will decrease as the distance from the energised pipe increases. A lot will depend on the conductivity of the soil. What type of soil is it? What chemicals or fertilisers have been applied to the grass or flowers that have now been carried deep into the soil? And what season is it? If it's winter and very wet conditions, the conductivity will be much greater than in a long, hot, dry summer. Shown in this example, if the energised pipe and the earth rod are close together, the induced voltage might be quite high, say 150 volts in this drawing. The customer will know about this if they are touching bonded or earth parts in the shed at the time of a fault. We've kept it simple here as an in-depth look at bonding is the subject of another video. So generally, if the supply to the house is a TNS or TNCS earthing system, there are far less problems if the supply to the shed or outbuilding is kept as a three-wire system, even if this means increasing cable sizes. A summary then, SWA cable is the preferred method for underground cables and should be sized taking into account load, distance and installation conditions. SWA cable armouring will usually be sufficient to match the conductor sizes for normal fault-free conditions. Three earthing systems to consider in domestic installations, TT, TNS, TNCS. A TT system will require an earth rod at the shed. TNS is a three-wire system throughout the whole system. TNCS is a two-wire system up to the house where the earth and neutral are separated and it now becomes a three-wire system. Once separated, a TNCS should never be recombined. The feet of the shed must be as a three-wire installation. If extraneous conductive parts are in the shed, anything earthy, such as water pipes and other services, metallic building parts, etc., then bonding is required. Preferably, this will be provided by a 10mm 3-core SWA. Converting a TN system to a TT system is not ideal, as the proximity of the earth rod to other services can cause problems. For the small extra expense, install 10mm SWA rather than convert the shed to a TT system. And there we are. Hopefully, this video has been useful to you and a little more knowledge has found its way into your mental toolbox. Thank you for watching this video. It is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. Here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. At your web browser, enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar. Select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered and the website, as shown, will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. Click on Return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video.
or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector. Page 2, page 3 and so on that will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel. Don't miss the next one. Once again, thanks for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.